Good evening, everyone. My name is Angel Donahue Rodriguez. I will be the meeting moderator tonight. Jilly Linnell, our capital, our director of capital planning, is going to give a presentation. We ask you to please hold all comments up to the end of that presentation. We have planned the meeting to go until 7.30 p.m. this evening. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few meeting controls for folks who are not familiar with Zoom. Next slide, please. We have closed captions for this meeting. By default, subtitles should be appearing on the bottom of your screen. If you do not see these captions, please press closed caption button to get them started. Next slide, please. If you have a clarifying question, please type it, please type it into, into the chat during the following during the presentation and our staff members named technical support can assist you. We have an ASL interpreter. If you would like to view the ASL interpreter at all times, please keep your viewing settings in gallery mode. It should be the default setting. You can change this by clicking the bottom that says gallery mode in the top right of your screen. Gallery mode shows all presenters on the screen together. This ensures you can see the interpreter as well as the speaker. If a presenter is sharing slides, the view will change. The screen will primarily display the slides with the presenters with, with the presenters and interpreters video moving to the small to be small at the top right of your corner of your corner. Often the default setting will show only the speaker, not the ASL interpreter. To change this, you can you can pin the interpreter's video. To do this, click the ellipses at the top right corner of the interpreter's video and select pin video. You will need to repeat this process each time to switch interpreters. We're also offering Spanish and Chinese interpretation this evening. You will notice a globe icon at the bottom of your screen. Please select English in the drop down menu if you wish to remain in the English room. And the same applies to the other language options. You will be able to see the presentation by, but only hear the audio in the language you have selected. To, to make a comment, you must virtually raise your hand. To do this, to do this on, the, on the computer, please press Alt-Y or click the raise hand button under the participants tab at the bottom center of your screen. On a mobile device, tap the raise hand button in the bottom of your, at the bottom center of your screen or on the phone, you can simply do it by dialing star nine. Now I'd like to introduce Jillian Linnell who will be making the presentation for this evening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us tonight for our second of three public meetings on the MBTA's proposed fiscal year 23 to 27 CIP. Um, as it has already been mentioned, we are planning to spend some time today at the start of this meeting. We, we will go through a brief presentation to introduce the proposed CIP, which as of last Thursday, or sorry, two weeks ago, was released for a 30 day public comment period. We should then have plenty of time during the second half of the meeting to hear from all of you. To get us started, the five year capital investment plan is a short term financially constrained investment program that funds the planning, construction and capital maintenance of assets across the MBTA. It is a rolling five year plan that is updated annually. Next slide, please. To help set the stage for what is included in the MBTA CIP, this slide offers a high level look at the MBTA system, which includes three heavy rail lines, two light rail lines, bus network, commuter rail network, ferry service, and the ride, which is the MBTA's paratransit service. Also included on this slide 
are a number are the numbers of stations stops and stops of, on each of those lines the total number of vehicles in our inventory that provide service across those different modes and the total number is number of riders reflected as an average of weekday trips as of october 2019 and october 2021 next slide please over the last five to seven years, the MBTA has dramatically increased or ramped up our overall capital investment. In fiscal year 21, the MBTA achieved a record $1.9 billion in capital, in capital spend, which reflects a significant achievement and puts us on a strong path to building a more reliable and dependable MBTA. This spend is the outcome of a number of major capital programs and projects that are on a trajectory for success and a number of transformation and expansion programs that are ongoing. These capital investments, many of which have been in the works since 2015, have produced real and significant improvements to the condition of the MBTA's many assets. Next slide, please. Looking more closely at the fiscal year 23 to 27 capital plan, this year, the MBTA has published a standalone or MBTA only CIP document that is the first five year plan published since the fiscal year 20 to 24 CIP. In fiscal years 21 and 22, due to the ongoing COVID 19 pandemic, the MBTA, along with our partners at MassDOT, published a one year maintenance of effort CIP, which focused on continuing programs already underway and some key targeted investments for the future. Next slide, please. Each year, the MBTA undertakes a robust process that strives to build a capital plan that reflects a balanced portfolio of investments. The key steps in developing this plan are outlined here. The process begins with the collection of updated cash flows for existing projects, which inform our understanding of available sources and our estimated funding level across the five-year window. We conduct a call for projects where sponsors from MBTA departments submit requests for funds. These requests include new capital projects or additional funds for existing projects or additional phases. All requests are scored by small cross-functional evaluation teams using eight criteria that include system preservation, mobility, cost effectiveness, environmental and health effects, policy support, social equity, economic impact, and safety. The CIP is sorted into distinct programs and in advance of prioritizing investments, program sizes are set based on agency goals and priorities. Using the results of project scoring, prioritization meetings are held with MBTA leadership to, to determine project priorities within each of the CIP programs. Projects are then incorporated into the five-year CIP based on priority, agency capacity, and availability of funds. We are here tonight because we are now approaching the final step in the process with the release of the proposed CIP for public comment. Following the public comment period, the plan will be finalized and presented to the full MBTA board for approval. Next slide, please. The MBTA CIP is often referred to as a priority-driven investment strategy, and it is aligned with the priorities and program structure that is consistent across MassDOT and all MassDOT divisions. The 23 to 27 CIP includes two overarching priorities. First is the reliability and modernization of the transit system. And secondly is the expansion of the transportation network to increase capacity and multimodal options. The next level of organization or below these priorities are programs. The CIP includes 10 investment programs, which are sized annually based on agency priorities and available resources. Programs under the reliability and modernization priority are largely asset-based, and the programs under the expansion priority fund the planning, design, and construction of key expansion projects, including South Coast Rail and GLX. Next slide, please. Moving into how the MBTA funds our capital projects, this slide offers a high-level summary of the sources that support our capital program, which are broken down into four primary categories. Starting with federal funds, the MBTA receives federal formula funding through three programs administered by the Federal Transit Administration, each with their own unique goals and objectives. These programs include the Urbanized Area Program, or what is commonly referred to as Section 5307, the Bus and Bus Facilities Program, which is Section 5339, and the State of Good Repair Program, which is Section 5337. 
These three formula programs provide predictable annual funding levels to support the MBTA's capital program. In addition, the MBTA is eligible and is often awarded competitive funding grants from a range of federal agencies, including USDOT, Federal Transit Administration, and the Federal Railroad Administration. And once awarded, those funds are then reflected as sources in the CIP. Moving on to state sources, the MBTA currently receives state funding as either Commonwealth Rail Enhancement Bonds or Commonwealth General Obligation bond, Bonds, or bond cap both of which support specific projects such as South Coast Rail, Phase 1, GLX, Red Line, Orange Line vehicle and infrastructure improvements, and the procurement of bi-level coaches. The third type of funding included in the CIP is MBTA sources. The first subcategory of MBTA sources are bonds, which broadly include taxable, tax-exempt, and sustainability bonds, which are made available each year to support the capital program. A second component of our MBTA sources are Build America Bureau loans, which the MBTA can pursue to support large federally eligible capital programs through either the TIFIA program or the RIF program. Um, there are two more MBTA sources. First is operating budget transfers, which are funds that pass through from the MBTA's operating budget to the capital program. And then finally, there's the capital maintenance fund, which is a limited fund held by the authority that may be used at the discretion of the CFO. The final type of funding that the MBTA receives are reimbursable sources or funding from outside sources that are established through partnerships or formal agreements to complete a specific scope of work. Next slide, please. Looking a little bit more closely at sources, I will take a moment and address the new Federal Transportation Authorization Bill, which was signed into law on November 15th, 2021. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law or bill for short form, reauthorized surface transportation programs for federal fiscal years 22 through 26 and provides capital funding to public transit through two channels. The first is federal formula programs and second are discretionary or competitive grant programs. Our source assumptions that were used to develop the five year proposed CIP do reflect our current estimates of federal formula funding levels under this new authorization, which do reflect a new baseline of funding levels. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law also, also reauthorized a significant number of transit and infrastructure competitive grant programs. We expect these competitive grant programs to run annual funding rounds over the five-year timeframe of the authorization. The MBTA will need to develop and submit an application for each opportunity during each funding round and will compete with transit agencies and other public entities across the country. The MBTA is already and will continue to aggressively pursue all eligible discretionary funding opportunities, and we will do so by proactively identifying these funding opportunities and which capital projects are eligible. We will then work to develop a grant application for the strongest capital project that aligns with the program's stated goals and objectives. In doing this, we will strive to seek funding for projects that align with the MBTA's stated goals, our strategic mission, and the five-year capital investment program, which remains the MBTA statement of priorities for capital investment. We will continue to use the annual CIP development process to establish the pool of projects for which we may develop discretionary grant applications. Next slide, please. Jumping into what is included in the five-year plan, this slide offers a high-level summary of the proposed fiscal year 23 to 27 CIP. As drafted, the five-year plan includes 552 capital projects representing $9.4 billion in program spend, with projects being ex executed by 32 MBTA departments. Reliability and modernization investments account for the majority of the projects and expected spend across the five-year window. However, there are 12 expansion projects representing just under a billion dollars. On the right-hand side, you can see overall priorities as reflected by program size, which demonstrate an ongoing commitment to investing in the MBTA's vehicle and guideway, signal and power assets, followed by the agency's maintenance and administrative facilities. Next slide, please. This slide shows overall investment by mode, and on the right-hand side are the top 15 projects as defined by fiscal year 23 to 27 projected spend. 
Many of these are well-known underway investments and include South Coast Rail, Green Line Extension, Air Transformation, a number of notable vehicle procurements such as the Red Line Orange Line vehicles, Green Line Type 10 vehicles, hybrid buses, and bi-level coaches. Also included is the Quincy Bus Facility Modernization Project, the Longfellow Approach, the Safety Critical Green Line Train Protection Project, ATC Implementation, and North Station Draw 1 Bridge Replacement. Next slide, please. The next three slides offer a spotlight on key safety, accessibility, and sustainability and resiliency investments in the capital plan. Starting with safety, there are over 430 safety-related projects in the capital program. This includes projects that are being executed by the safety department, such as the ongoing implementation of the MBTA safety management system. It also includes over 230 projects that will inspect, repair, and upgrade the MBTA's assets and over 100 projects that are focused on modernizing our maintenance and operations facilities, which will help ensure workforce safety. On the right-hand side of the slide, we have noted a number of key safety projects by mode, and I will note that there is a significant amount of information about a number of these ongoing projects and many more capital investments on the MBTA's website. Next slide, please. The CIP currently includes 80 projects with significant accessibility investments, accounting for roughly $1.2 billion of program spending. This includes over 30 projects that will improve accessibility at the MBTA stations, bus stops, which includes small and full-scale upgrades to platforms, paths of travel, and surfaces. There are also over 35 projects to upgrade and improve elevators, escalators, and wayfinding at key stations to bring them into compliance with ADA, MAAB, BCIL, and internal guidelines and standards. And finally, the CIP includes a number of key vehicle procurements, which will result in improved accessibility features. Next slide, please. And finally, a quick look at the range of sustainability and resiliency investments included in the MBTA CIP, which includes over 130 projects, accounting for roughly $3.7 billion in program spending. There are over 60 resiliency projects, including vulnerability assessments, asset management, and asset hardening to curb climate change and environmental impact system-wide. There are also over 20 projects related to energy, waste management, and environmental compliance and remediation to ensure efficiency and long-term sustainability and resiliency of our service and our facilities. And finally, there are over 35 projects that will procure, overhaul, and upgrade the MBTA's fleet and facilities for bus electrification, vehicle efficiency, and reducing our carbon footprint. Next slide, please. As it has been mentioned, the MBTA has developed and released a standalone five-year capital investment plan document, which is shown here, and which is currently available on the MBTA's website. The document is structured around three major components. First is an overview of the CIP, which includes details about what the CIP is, how it is funded, and the annual development process. Second are one-page overviews for each CIP program, which are um, which provide a summary of the program goals and investment level by mode. And finally, there is a detailed listing of all capital projects included in the 23 to 27 CIP, including a brief project description, project phase, primary mode, planned five-year spend, and the total project budget. Next slide, please. To accompany the publishing of the CIP document, we are also inviting public engagement and comment through multiple channels. Central to our public engagement process are the three public meetings, which will all be held virtually. In addition, we are encouraging everyone to share their comments using our online public comment tool, and we will also be accepting comments via email or letter. 
public comment period will wrap up on April 25th. We then will finalize the 23 to 27 CIP and will return to the MBTA board for a vote to approve in May. With that, I will conclude my presentation and we are happy to answer any questions or take any comments. Thank you, Jillian, for that presentation. To make a comment, you must virtually raise your hand. To do this on the computer, press Alt-Y or click the raise hand button under the participants tab at the bottom center of your screen. On a, on a mobile device, tap the, ra tap the hand ra raise hand button at the bottom center of your screen. On the phone, you can do that by simply dialing star nine. Once you raise your hand, you'll be added to a queue with others who have raised their hands. I will call on, fo on folks first come for a serve basis. When it is your turn to speak, I will say your name or the last four digits of your phone number and let you know that I am unmuting you. If you are on a computer or a mobile device, a box will pop up at the center of your screen. You will need to confirm that you would like, that you would like to be unmuted before you begin speaking. If you're on the phone, an automated recording will let you know that you are, un that you are unmuted. You may speak as soon as the recording finishes. Once you're unmuted, everyone on the screen and in the meeting can hear you. Before making your comment, please state your name and any organizational affiliation. Please limit all comments to no more than two minutes. We ask that you only make one comment at a time so we can ensure that everyone gets an opportunity to speak. If you have additional comments, please raise your hand again. As soon as you're finished, you will be muted again. You may also post comments in the chat and we will document them as part of the meeting record. Please send your comments to ask questions here. And with that, um, I see I have a few hands raised. And the first person I'm going to call on is Franklin uh, Salambini. And I, I apologize if I've mispronounced your, your last name. Ask anyone to mute you now. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Ino. Um, very happy to be here. I First of all, my, my comment really relates to the uh, $68 million that is being proposed for work on the Green Line, the E branch running up Huntington Avenue to Heath Street. I want to thank the T for including that item in the CIP. I'm assuming, I, I haven't seen a lot of the details, but I'm assuming that the work on that project relates in great, great part, or at least in a major portion, to the street running portion of the Green Line from Brigham Circle to Heath Street, particularly with regard to not only providing safe boarding for passengers, as you know, currently uh, passengers have to walk between moving traffic in order to get onto the uh, streetcar in those destinations. So I'm hoping that that's part of the project here, but I would like to address uh, a piece that I think is missing, but would be valuable and uh, that involves extending the line from Heath Street to Hyde Square. Heath Street is, Hyde Square would provide a vibrant location for a terminus and it also provides the necessary massing for a rail line. Heath Street lacks some of that and I think you also know that the type 10s that are going to be on the property hopefully within 10 years or so uh, are not able to negotiate the curve at the terminus in, uh, in Heath Street. So a straight on station would be necessary. That plus the fact that Hyde Square is a vibrant destination argues I think in favor of extending the line and including that extension in this current set. The, there are benefits to the T in doing this, not only providing uh, a suitable terminus for type 10 vehicles and turning them from uh, outbound to inbound. But it also, I think, provides the T with an opportunity to increase Green Line ridership and also to relieve some of the pressure on the 39 bus. One suggestion that I would make is with an extended Green Line to Hyde Square, the 39 bus could run as a limited service during rush hours from uh, the uh, intersection at Center and South Huntington down to Northeastern allowing the streetcar to be a local service for that part of the line. There is a significant amount of support for this. I think you've already heard from Representative Nika Eligardo, and I know that uh, Councilor uh, 
Kendra Lara is hoping to speak tonight as well on this issue. So I, I think my two, my two minutes are up and I don't want to uh, take away from others, but that is my, my suggestion with regard to the SIP that uh, the Green Line extension to Hyde Square be included in the, uh, in the proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as you noted, we are aware um, and we have received um, comments on that similar topic, so thank you. Our current planning on the E branch is focused on improving the safety and accessibility of the existing corridor. However, the design is being done and advanced with considerations for uh, potential future phases. Thank you, Jillian. Uh, next uh, in my order, I see Representative Kate Lipper Garabedian. I'm going to ask to meet you. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much uh, for making this public comment time for everyone. I'm Kate Lipper Garabedian. I'm the state representative for the 32nd Middlesex District, which is proud to support multiple bus lines, including some we hope will be coming back online imminently five commuter rail stations, as well as uh, being contiguous to the Oak Grove um, MBTA station and the Orange Line. So we're a very transit oriented district. And tonight speaking on behalf of the state delegation and with support from Wakefield town councilors, as well as the Wakefield Disability Commission, I wanna raise up the importance of addressing the lack of accessibility at the Wakefield commuter rail station, which is right downtown in Wakefield. Consistent with advocacy, both from my predecessor as a full delegation and then with me in this role, um, over multiple years, we've been in touch with the MBTA about our concerns that the commuter rail stations in Wakefield neither are accessible. And I'm very glad that the CIP includes accessibility as a key consideration for your projects. We would argue that the uh, Wakefield station needs to be added to your priority list. Um, the Wakefield uh, leaders have shown tremendous uh, commitment to meeting state goals. For example, there are now more than 400 transit oriented units that have come online that are within throwing distance of this station. And yet if somebody is mobility impaired, they cannot get on the commuter rail at this stop. Instead, they'd have to travel north to Reading, which has only, which excuse me, has no accessible parking lot um, spaces according to your information or south to Melrose, which has only two, to be able to access the commuter uh, train by a mini high platform. Uh, in 2019, the state delegation reached out to request mini high platforms at the Wakefield station. And at that time, the MBTA responded that mini highs were no longer being considered. Um, we then asked for a fully accessible platform last year and are going to reiterate that request this cycle. However, to the degree that that is just not feasible in the next five fiscal years, we would encourage and appreciate that the MBTA is revisiting its, um, its guidance on many high platforms and would accept that as a interim solution. Um, again, we're talking about more than 400 new transit-oriented units that have come online, in addition to already many riders who have ac accessed uh, the train by Wakefield. And we would greatly appreciate the MBTA adding this to a priority list uh, to help the, 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 the residents of Wakefield to um, treat our mobility-impaired riders with dignity and to assist the state in meeting its statutorily uh, obligated requirements around climate goals. I will be following up with a letter with the full delegation and you'll also will expect to hear um, from the town officials as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. Um, uh, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing that letter and, uh, and having any additional conversations in the future. Next uh, on my screen I have, I'm gonna call in Naftali Poritz. Uh, I'm gonna ask to unmute you now. Hi everyone, my name is Naftali Ports and I, I, have, I have a couple of things. First, I would like to ask Alistair Sawyers about, about what the status of the EMUs for the commuter rail are. Um, last May was the last time you obviously talked about it, but, but, but since last May, you know, Alistair, um, there hasn't been any word or any further discussion as far as like e EMUs or, or electrification as far as the commuter rail. And I don't know what 
electric multiple unit trains or electric vehicles for the commuter rail you're, you're currently looking at and what you're most likely to consider. Hi, Matt. Yeah, I'll respond to that, Naftali. Uh, Alistair Soares, Head of Rail Transformation for the MBTA. So uh, you would have heard last year that uh, we had some discussions at the board uh, about an electric multiple unit pilot for the Northeast Corridor. Uh, the, yes. board that, the board at that point chose not to proceed uh, due to issues with having to develop a depot. In the interim, we've been doing a technology study, which we have now completed. And we've moved on to issue a request for information from the industry for battery electric multiple units. Benefit there being we don't have to build as much uh, overhead catenary and it enables delivery a lot faster and it means we can leverage the existing uh, electrification on the corridor uh, to run services to other lines that do not have that, that wire. That is still not a very quick process because those are relatively new technology to the US. Uh, we're talking to four manufacturers at the moment. I can't particularly favor one or the other, but at least one of them, sorry, at least two of them already have orders here in the US for that type of um, technology. Um, so we're in the, in the scope of kind of proving out our assumptions from our technology, technology study and we'll be in a position to kind of report back to the board on that later this year. Um, yeah, uh, Alistair, I mean, the problem with the current fleet is, is not only the outdated coaches, but the problem with the current fleet is that they, they never open all the doors and they have this policy of opening like only doors that are attended by a crew member. Like they sh like at full length pilot platforms, they should have like all doors boarding. So, there are issues um, with different levels of boarding. And as, as the representative just discussed, uh, a lot of our platforms do have mini highs. So it, it isn't an option to do all door boarding. Um, however, um, we have expanded the amount of all door boarding for the stations that do have full high level access, which is mainly the yeah. old column. Yeah. Okay, so so then in that case of what you heard that that maybe you should consider like battery electric multiple units that can even charge on the um, on the existing canary and and I know one manufacturer is you should consider basically you know a Stadler flirt train that's similar in in look to like the ones being used in the in the UK. Uh, we're looking at all effectively four or five manufacturers that have that kind of technology um, without going down the rabbit hole. Uh, there, there is some issue with that particular model, but there are other models that will work on our system. So, so like, like, like yeah, what, what models are you looking, so like what models are you looking at now? We'll be giving you a full report. Uh, we haven't finished that dialogue yet, so we don't want to particularly advantage one manufacturer over the other, but once we've done that, will be reporting back to the board with a full information package on what's available. Thank you, Alistair. Because uh, okay. Mr. Mr. Ports, I, I, I apologize. I'm going to have to, I have to move on because I have to, I want to make sure that other folks have an opportunity to speak. I would encourage you. Okay. And then, what, to, to, okay, and then once everyone speaks, I'll, you know, maybe give my other thing if we have enough time. Sounds like a plan. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, I'm going to go to Mr. Alan Smith. I'm going to ask to unmute you. Mr. Smith. Thank you very much. I appreciate the MBTA doing this. The new MBTA that believes in expansion and growth to uh, meet the growing needs of our community. Um, I also want to speak in support of extending the, the green line <clears throat> to Hyde Square. In the last 15 years, that little bit more than half a mile has been transformed from institutional use to uh, dense residential use, upwards of 1,200 residents, I believe, in a little bit more than half a mile. From your own documents, the MBTA strives to improve the reliability of the system and modernize existing assets to accommodate current or anticipated growth. This is current and ongoing growth, very significant growth, and it needs 
<clears throat> an increased service from MBTA precisely in the form of this extension. Um, your document also speaks of a need to make targeted investments in the expansion of the transportation network. And you are, you are investing in the expansion of the Green Line to Somerville and to Medford. And I congratulate you and I celebrate the fact that you're doing such a great job. Um, this is part of expansion. It's a modest bit more than half a mile and it's crucial and fundamental. This is the moment to do it. That was the need, now is when to do it. There's something called economy of scale. If you're going to repoint a wall and have scaffolding, you might as well also do the windows and take advantage of that scaffolding. Economy of scale speaks in favor of this being the opportune moment, now that the MBTA is going to work on the track between Brigham Circle and Heath. There's no reason in the world to stop at Heath. Uh, it, it doesn't have a dense residential a community and there's no commercial interest. It's a, it's a rather dead and dull <clears throat> and insignificant place uh, to stop. And besides turning around those big new long cars will not be possible. This is the time to include in the CIP this very modest but very significant extension of the Green Line. Thank you very much. Thank you for your continued support and comment. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, next, uh, I am going to ask to unmute Mr. Michael uh, Reskin. I apologize if I mispronounce your name. I'm asking to unmute you now. Hello, my name is Michael Reskin. Uh, I live at uh, 425 South Huntington Avenue in Jamaica Plain uh, on the 39 bus line. And I'm a member of the Jamaica Plain Neighborhood Council. I'd like to also uh, congratulate you on adding the E-Branch accessibility uh, capacity improvements uh, from Northeastern Station to Heath Street Station um, and urge you to extend uh, the line further uh, to Hyde Square. Um, I think uh, this shows a commitment that the MBTA is committed to uh, in-street Green Line service and at a modest cost, modest cost, you could get a lot more ridership by extending to Hyde Square, a high ridership neighborhood, uh, which is transit dependent and majority uh, people of color. Um, there's a high community need and a high community support. This project has been in the Go Boston 2030 comprehensive traffic uh, transportation plan and in the Boston uh, Planning and Development Agency's planning for South Huntington Avenue. This has been repeatedly requested year after year. And I'd like to ask you um, uh, two questions. Why uh, are you refusing to add this request to the CIP? And uh, a, a simpler question, is it $68 million or $85.7 million? for the uh, present CIP uh, accessibility. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you. As we, as I mentioned previously, our current planning is focused on improving the safety and accessibility of the current, of the existing corridor. Um, and unfortunately not at the moment um, focused on additional expansion, um, but we will take those comments back um, for consideration. Regarding the follow-up question about the project, I will quickly uh, pull that information together and we'll provide that shortly. Thank you. Thanks, Jillian. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Reiskin. Uh, next, I'm gonna call on Mr. Peter Steiger. I'm asking to unmute you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, considering me uh, to make a comment here. My name is Peter Steiger. I've been a Massachusetts president since 1990, a J uh, Jamaica Plain resident since 2013. I grew up in Switzerland, which I think to many is public uh, transportation paradise. So I was spoiled growing up uh, learning what a really well-functioning public transportation system can do. 
And I'm really excited about seeing everything that is in the CIP and, and about all of the plans uh, being uh, discussed here. Uh, today I'm here representing the Jamaica Pond Association, which is a neighborhood association representing the area of Jamaica Plain, Plain uh, nestled between Olmsted Park and Center Street and Southampton Avenue. I have served on the board of the Jamaica Plain Association for nine years and I'm currently serving as their vice chair. Uh, I've been authorized to speak on behalf of the association at today's event uh, and I'm very happy to do so. Uh, like the previous speakers, Franklin Salandin, uh, Alan Smith and Michael Reiskin, I'm really uh, here today to strongly encourage uh, the MBTA to include the extension uh, to Hyde Square in the CIP uh, for all of the reasons that have been mentioned already. And I do not want to reiterate all of those. Uh, but I do want to highlight one thing uh, that was uh, mentioned in the introductory uh, comments um, uh, by Gillian, which is that uh, there, there are two overarching goals uh, that are driving the investments the MBTA is making into the system. And I do remember hearing that one of them is really extending reach. And um, Gillian, you pointed out that uh, this was sort of out of scope in terms of ext uh, an extension of the green line. But I would argue that this is not necessarily about extending the green line. It is about extending reach. And uh, as my previous speakers have highlighted, the importance of serving a corridor that has increased dramatically in its population and reaching a vibrant neighborhood within Boston, uh, Boston's Latin Quarter, that has become a destination. And I think that's the way in which this extension should be viewed. Clearly, the time is now. Um, as uh, um, Alan said, uh, you don't put up a scaffolding to repair a wall without taking care of the windows. This is a very good uh, metaphor for what I think we need to do here today uh, in considering that extension. Um, it is a window of opportunity that should be seized, and uh, I hope that you will consider doing that. So in conclusion, on behalf of the Jamaica Pond Association and the residents of Jamaica Plain, and the residents of Boston's Latin Quarter, I request that the Green Line extension to Hyde Square be included in the capital investment plan. It is compatible with the expansion of light rail network to reach a key destination, and that's the Boston Latin Quarter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as we mentioned, there are two priorities within the CIP. The first is the reliability and the modernization of the existing system followed then after by the expansion. Um, as we've mentioned, the current planning on the E-Branch project in the CIP it continues to focus on improving the safety and accessibility of the corridor, but we are really appreciative for everyone's comments today and the ongoing support. Um, just to circle back on the previous question, I do wanna verify that the E-Branch accessibility project in the CIP is programmed for $85.9 million total with 85.7 million in the five-year window. Thank you, Jillian. Uh, there was a question in the chat uh, regarding the Heinz Convention Center. Uh, the question was, this is an important item for all mobility impaired users of the Green Line. Does the CIP spend, uh, spend to take, uh, plan on uh, taking this project out to completion? Um, so the MBTA is committed to this very important accessibility project. Um, it is currently in design, I believe, and um, we are committed to continuing to work on this project with the relevant parties. Thanks, Jillian. Uh, next, uh, I'm going to call um, Matthew Barrison. I'm going to ask to unmute you. Hello. Hello, Mr. Barrison. Hi, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll keep my comments brief. Um, I, I live in East Boston and uh, I, I was looking at some of the uh, CIP um, items for the blue line. 
And um, I saw that there were quite a few uh, signal improvements, blue line master plan, blue line station studies, midlife vehicle overhaul, um, and, and so on, not including the not even including the red blue connector. Um, what I would like to ask the MBTA is to consider a blue line transformation program. Um, I have been enjoying checking the MBTA website every now and then, following along with the green line and orange and red line transformation. And I feel like the blue line is a little stepchilded somewhat. And um, uh, there's, there's a few entries on some work happening on the blue line, but it's not, uh, it's not consolidated in, in one place. So I, I think the green line, blue, uh, red and orange line transformation websites have been really good. And I would like to ask you to replicate that just so that the public can more easily follow along with all the various um, projects that are mentioned in the capital improvement project. Um, and uh, we'll, I, I think that helps the public look at the improvements holistically and offer better feedback rather than seeing it at one small project at a time. So thank you very much. Thank you for your support and suggestion. We really appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Uh, next, I am going to call on Helena Tung. I'm asking to unmute you now. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you all for this presentation. Um, I have been, I, I'm sure you have seen thus far that I have submitted six times that I had asked if you could please screen share the pros project cost breakdown again. Um, and also, I wanted to make a comment. Um, on two areas that I saw within the project breakdown for the red line and the orange line, which are one of which are two of the most heavily traveled lines within the city of Boston in particular. And it just, you know, over the years, it does seem that there has been really a great significant effort or finance and put in to really making sure those lines are accessible, safe. Um, I can add some extras, you know, the foundations in the um, train areas that are cracked. Um, these are things that are concerning. Um, and also the reliability of the services and making sure that there are enough uh, reliability um, for the services for those who are taking those services. I think what's more concerning to me is the number of people standing on a platform waiting for a train and concerning about the number of people on a platform. So, you know, it'd be great to know that if the red line and the orange line could move up on the scale, of really making sure it's safe. Um, there's more reliability. Um, also on the 66 to 28, the 39 as well. Um, I have five schools in my area and I've had submitted the data to the MBTA. And one of the main reasons and concerns that the schools have in this area is students getting to school on time. And so when students are not getting to school on time, they're not getting 100% of their education. So if we have two or three bus lines and they're still not getting to school on time and I've submitted that data and I'm not receiving I've submitted that data to the MBTA. I've submitted that data to our elected officials in this area, and still students are getting to school late. So, you know, I hear about all these connectivities, but I think it's also looking at what's in place now, making sure at least students that are traveling to five schools in my area can get to school on time. That's a minimum with Christ. That's, that's the end of my comments. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate it. As you are likely familiar, the MBTA has been um, invested in a red and orange line transformation program for a number of, of years now, which is centered around um, the procurement of a new red line and orange line vehicle fleet. Um, we have also been focused on track signal improvements and the necessary facility improvements to um, accept and then operate all of those vehicles. 
with the primary goals, as you mentioned, of increased reliability, service, and safety. So we really do appreciate all of your comments, um, and we are working hard to continue to implement that overall transformation program of the red and orange lines. The only comment I, I would just add to that is we're, 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 we're also um, accelerating a lot of these projects as well as part of our, uh, uh, as part of our capital improvement plan. Um, so, uh, you know, when we do these diversions, these are things that, that we take into consideration. So thank you for your comment. Next, uh, I'm going to call on Evan Mormon. I'm asking to unmute you now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I thanks for the great work. Um, I just have one main comment, which is I'd like to see more focus on electrifying the MBTA. Um, and I say, and I know, I know you've done studies on that and you're looking at that now, but I don't see a real strong um, capital uh, investment in this document right here for that. Um, we have a 400 miles of regional rail and I just think it's a really low hanging fruit to electrify the MBTA and improve service frequency to try to turn it into more of an S-bond system um, you'd serve, you know, the entire region of four or five million people. Um, and I think even assuming, even assuming our capital costs problems in this country, you could do it for, you know, six to $8 billion. And when you're talking about the green line, as great of a project as that is, that's, um, two and a half billion dollars for six, seven miles of rail granted in a very dense area, but with, with commuter rail, you can serve the entire region. Uh, more effectively. So I'd just like to, to focus on, I'd like uh, you to consider an increased focus on commuter rail electrification, um, trying to move it into more of an S-Bond system. Um, I just really think you could serve more people, a wider variety of people. And on that last point, you know, I know there's a lot of concern about uh, will commuter rail ridership come back? And I share that concern, considering that most riders of the commuter rail are white collar people with a lot of money. Um, but I think if you transition into it more of an S-bond system and you worked on that frequency and electrification, I think you could serve a wider variety of people um, if you tied the fares uh, to the fares on, on, the, on the subway and such. So anyways, thank you for your time. And uh, I just wanna see a greater focus on that commuter rail. Thank you. Well, Evan, thank you for your support. Uh, I guess the one thing I'd say to all the other people on the line uh, is uh, effectively rail transformation is based on rail vision, which was a, a, a view of how to turn the existing commuter rail into a S-Bahn style, i.e. regional rail style system with all day bi-directional clock face service um, with the aim of widening the ridership and addressing the needs of the communities other than pure commuters, um, also to increase an urban service as well, to uh, increase frequencies and make it more um, usable for uh, shorter, shorter journeys and journeys between towns in the region, not just to Boston. So we hear you, that is the intent of rail transformation. Uh, it is our long-term goal. The one thing I would caution is um, it's not a quick process, but one of the things we're trying to do is look at alternative technologies to reduce the need to build out uh, uh, overhead catenary, which takes a very long time, and the environmental process is long. Use of battery actually could accelerate our ability to deliver this system because on existing estimates, it would take us a long period in excess of uh, 15 years to do that um, around the, the entire 400 miles. So. We're trying, and that's part of the reason why we're taking our time studying it, is to find cost-effective and quicker ways of doing it. Thanks, Alistair. Uh, I'm gonna do a quick comment that we had, just we have an answer um, on the chat, uh, written by Abby Swain, uh, Heinz Convention Center Station. This is an important project for all mobility impaired uh, of the Greenland. Does this CIP spend take the, uh, 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 take the project to completion? Um, so we just want to let you know that there's $45.7 million for design and construction. Um, and so I, I just wanted to let you know that that's included in the CIP. 
next, uh, I'm gonna call on Councilor Ricardo Arroyo. Councilor. Thank you, uh, and I appreciate you taking the time today for public comment. Uh, I'm, call, I'm uh, zooming in to speak on two things. One is uh, asking the T for $200,000 in this proposed budget for a noise and sound vibration study uh, to investigate the rebuild yard five and Fairmount uh, commuter rail noises. Uh, this is something that's been going on for over a decade. Uh, it's followed, I think three of my predecessors have been trying to sort of get a grip on the, the sound and noise coming from the MBTA that, that comes from uh, the Fairmount line and, and that area. Uh, of the rail yard. And so I believe that there's money in this budget set aside for that. And I'd like to make sure that it stays there for that sound study. Uh, in addition to the $200,000 for the noise and sound engineer, I'm actually also asking to uh, have uh, a push towards electrification of the commuter rail system, specifically as well, the Fairmount line. Uh, and so those are the two sort of major initiatives uh, for, for me that you can do uh, at the MBTA. Uh, that would really greatly benefit my district and this area. Uh, and so thank you uh, for your time. Uh, and thank you to uh, those who have commented already uh, on these subjects. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Thank you. In regards to your first question about the, that is, sorry, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, we can. sorry. All right. Um, in regards to the sound study that is included in the current CIP, it is a small study, so it is actually included under the Commuter Rail Facility State of Good Repair Project, which is CIP ID P1144. But that scope of work is included under that project. And I'll just uh, add to the second part of your question, the electrification by whichever means, whether it's using battery or uh, overhead catenary is uh, part of phase one of rail transformation as directed by the FMCB when it was here. And um, that continues to be our objective. Thank you, Alistair. And thank you, Julian. Uh, and thank you, Councilor, for the questions. Next, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask to unmute John Kuiper. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, I live in Roxbury, Fort Hill, Highland Park, and um, I've been very impressed by the uh, new busway that's been uh, constructed on the uh, portion of um, uh, Columbus Avenue by Eggleston Square, but only go, currently goes up only as far as um, Jackson Square. Um, I live uh, right above the intersection of um, Columbus and, um, and Cedar Streets, which is possibly one of the most dangerous intersections in, uh, in Boston because there are frequent uh, collisions there. And um, I uh, oftentimes I walk across uh, Columbus at that point as a pedestrian. And every time I do, I feel I am taking my life in my hands. And I am very eager to uh, see them extend the busway all the way to Ruggle Station um, as soon as possible. I mean, this uh, section of uh, Columbus between um, uh, Jackson Square and Roxbury has had at least four automotive, auto vehicle fatalities in the last 35 years that I've been here. And I, we definitely need uh, a, you know, to calm the traffic down in this particular uh, area. And um, I believe that building a bus lane as they have already done in your know, further south on uh, Columbus Avenue would be the, uh, you know, one of the most effective ways to do it. And I believe this should be a priority project. Thank you. The Columbus Ave bus lane phase two project is included in the MBTA CIP. This is funded jointly by the MBTA in close coordination with our MassDOT and MPO partners. Um, so we are continuing to advance this project with our municipal partners 
um, through the early stages of planning and design. Thank you, Jillian. Um, next, I'm gonna call on uh, Rob Caruso. Mr. Caruso, I'm asking him to mute you. Did I mute? Hi, um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, my name is Rob Caruso and I'm from Newton. I'm also a member of the uh, Newton Commission on Disability. One of the questions I have is, uh, I know that the three commuter rail stations in Newton are under the, the design phase right now. I'm not sure exactly how far you are. Uh, I wanted to know, do you have any sources of funding for construction identified yet? I know that could be a problem. And uh, uh, this is a question for Mr. Rodriguez, if he's still there. Uh, he was going to look and see where there was a $20 million uh, amount of money that was placed, uh, according to the MBTA, in the bank for the Newton Auburndale uh, commuter rail station. And if he did happen to find that, where, where it is. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Caruso. Um, so uh, we've been working really closely with Mayor Fuller and the delegation um, since we had that public meeting, I believe in October. Um, I want to, uh, Jillian, please correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe that under the CIP, that the, design, the, the full design of 100% of these three stations is included in the CIP. I don't know the exact amount, um, but uh, these, these uh, stations are really complicated uh, to design. Um, I don't think we've hit 50% design yet, um, uh, but I think we presented um, at about 30% design uh, in, um, in late October. Yeah, uh, we, right. are, we are still working uh, on, on figuring, the, uh, figuring that out, that question that you mentioned. And as I said, that is, a, that is a question that is still being asked by the delegation. And we've been working in close coordination with them since October. And over the last month, we've been meeting on a weekly basis to, to, to try and discern that. Jillian? Yeah, just to support that response, um, as mentioned, the commuter rail stations are fully funded through 100% design currently in the CIP, which includes $12.7 million to support that initial effort. And we continue to explore opportunities to support the full construction funding for these very important three project, three station projects. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Caruso. Uh, next, I'm going to call on Alejandro uh, Viesos. Mr. Viesos, I'm going to ask to unmute you. Hey. Hi. Um, so I just have a question more so regarding the commuter rail than uh, anything else. Um, I was just wondering if you guys have like looked into like improving the frequency of like the services all yeah. across the board and um, changing the uh, changing the fare structure, especially for zone 1A. Uh, I've lived in Rosendale my whole life and um, it was a little challenging taking the train just because it was a little more expensive than like taking the bus more so than anything else. So I was just wondering if you guys were looking into that. I just personally think that if you want to include electrification, which I completely support for the system in the future, then first small things such as frequency and like affordability need to be accounted for it for the uh, commuter rail. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I'll um, clarify, I guess. Um, so we, we have been talking a lot about electrification, but rail transformation is um, technology agnostic. And the idea is actually to look at improving frequencies, targeting service at need. Um, that is the point. It's incidental that the other objective is to reduce carbon emissions and to electrify. And some of the way of achieving that higher frequency service is by using different equipment that's more efficient and can accelerate faster and provide the kinds of service you're talking about. Separately, the initial um, directional rail transformation did also include um, other aspects. So it's trying to be holistic which is looking at first mile, last mile, improvements to stations, and as you've just described, fair products and fair pricing. Um, that is, a, uh, for commuter rail, there are aspects that do require equity analysis. Um, it is a little difficult because the traditional riders are very different for the riders we're now targeting. Um, and that's not an easy thing to look at. And COVID has also challenged that to some degree. 
Um, so I can't really talk about precise ways we're going because it will have to look at uh, how demand changes. But um, we are certainly considering things like off-peak fares um, and um, um, reverse commute policies um, and looking at where the fare zones might sit once we change service. But prior to that, um, I guess the final point I need to make is we are looking at making what we call no regress investments to improve infrastructure so we can increase service even using diesel technology uh, with the current rolling stock. So we're trying to access, address everything within, as you pointed out, a constrained budget. Thank you, Alistair. Um, Mr. Vias, did you have a did you have a follow up question? No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, there's a question on the chat um, that I'm going to pull up, um, and it was an accessibility question regarding bus priority from Miss Abby Swain um asking about project p0613 um julian i don't know if you wanted to go ahead and take a stab at answering that particular question yes i believe it is in regards to patty and our inaccessible bus stops that are um being repaired so in 2017 the mbta surveyed all um, nearly 8,000 bus stops and determined that 273 were critical. Um, they then, of the 273, determined that 170 would be closed and the remaining 103 would be reconstructed. As of, um, I believe, roughly four or five months ago, 84 of those highest priority stops had been fully reconstructed with a handful still under construction, um, expected to be completed in the near term and with designs proceeding on um, up to nearly 30 additional of the critical stops. Um, so we understand the interest in the reconstruction of our bus stops and our system, our accessibility group continues to work very closely to sequence the improvement of these key bus stops. Um, also is coordinating very closely with our bus network redesign effort and how that will be implemented and rolled out across the system. Thanks, Jillian. Uh, next, uh, I'm going to go to Helena Tung. I'm going to ask to unmute you. Thank you again for accepting my um, follow-up questions. I have um, two questions here. I just wanted to know on the 2327 CIP, if the Fairmont line extension is part of that budget, um, the other piece is um, I've been living in this neighborhood since 1974, and I live in Hyde Park, right on the Hyde Park Mattapan Line, District 5, and the commuter rail <clears throat> runs right through the belly of our neighborhood. And we have been asking for a sound barrier for years. I can tell you every time a train, a commuter rail train travels east or west um, by just looking out my door. And so I was wondering if that could be possibly put into the next phase of projects. And thirdly, who would be the contact in regards to maintenance of the MBTA lines property? This is something that our community has taken up um, as a charity. Um, I spent one entire year sending emails. It was the thread was longer than the CVS receipt, trying to find somebody for the maintenance of the property when it was really dangerous with the trees overhanging on streets. So if you could just answer those three, that would be great. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Um, so there is no extension of the Fairmount line included currently in the CIP. We will take your recommendation on an additional sound study um, back. So we thank you for sharing that. And also, if you would like to submit specific comments through the CIP public comment process about maintenance efforts, we can make sure that those get back to the, our appropriate colleagues. And the only other thing I would add is under rail transformation, the intent is to electrify, which does change the noise profile quite significantly. Um, now, obviously, that's a long term solution, but um, that is certainly one of our goals. Thank you, Alistair. Uh, next, I'm going to call on Sarah Freeman. 
I'm going to ask to unmute you. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry, I arrived late due to another meeting. So I hope I'm understanding correctly um, what this is all about. I have two comments. Uh, I want to add my voice to those supporting the uh, Green Line extension, E-Line to Hyde Square. And uh, the second one is another project um, in JP, the Arbor Way uh, bus maintenance facility. I think everyone agrees that the temporary garage should go away and a lot of good uh, feelings about going to electric and sharing space, but I would want to put in a plug for more partnership, transit-oriented development um, that somehow 10 acres in a such a highly urban area seems like a lot for single use. Uh, just it, And it could be financially good for the T to find more partners for the rest of the space. So putting in my two cents there. Thank you. Thank you for your feedback. Uh, the funding to support the design of the Arbor Way bus facility is included in the CIP um, and we can take your comments back. So we appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. Um, and then the last hand that I see up is Mr. Naftali Port. Uh, uh, just as a reminder to folks to, to, uh, to keep your comments to two minutes. Uh, we are having another public meeting um, next Tuesday, I believe, uh, which which starts at seven o'clock. Uh, and there's also the ability to be able to comment uh, through our web portal. So uh, today, tonight's meeting will be concluding at 7.30. So Mr. Ports. Hi, hi, hi there. Hopefully we'll be in touch, you know, soon, Alistair Sawyers. So the second comment I was gonna give is, is I definitely think that the MBTA need, needs to fix the um, green line, you know, even even allow like the northbound platforms at Park Street, like the, the one that normally like terminates on the inner one to be able to continue the government center. And, and then also, you know, in addition to making the green line faster, I I would I would I am definitely for extending the green line to to Hyde Square, and then also the green line should be extended from Union Square to the the Porter Square as well as the Mystic Valley Parkway Route 16. I would also suggest that the that the sewer line be be converted to to, to light rail because the sewer line you know is bus driver transit and it's it's not a true rapid transit line and it. And it's more of an enhanced bus line. So, so I would suggest, you know, we, we have a light rail line, you know, goes from government center and then and then at Boylston use that old um, abandoned, you know, tunnel under Tremont Street, you know, and then and then you and then and then surface in the vicinity and then go to you know Tufts Medical Center and then surface. Out, run along the Washington Street, you know, car door down to Dudley, but it shouldn't end there. It should then run down and completely replace the Route 28 bus route down down Blue Hills Avenue to, you know, to Mattapan, and then and then use the existing right away from Mattapan to Ashmont. You know, it would allow for. It will allow for more efficient service, you know, because and also heavier cap capacity. You know, finally, finally, another comment is, is, you know, you really should consider putting like bike bike hooks or interior bike racks on the green line that are like ver vertical bike racks because because all the other light rail systems in the United States outside the MBTA, you know, I'll, you know, allow, allow accommodates bikes. And it'd be, and it'd be nice if you, you would kind of look into it. 
And that's what I have to say. So you can maybe, any, any follow-ups on that comment? I, I think we will um, very gratefully take your comments back for consideration. We really do appreciate all of the details um, that you have provided and all the thought that you have put into all of this. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next, uh, I am going to call on uh, Mr. Michael Reiskin, and I think there's one more question after that. Uh, Michael Reiskin uh, from uh, Jamaica Plain uh, on the 39, live on the 39 bus line at uh, South Huntington Avenue and a member of the Jamaica Plain Neighborhood Council. I'd like to uh, just compliment you for putting in the $36 million for design for a new Arbor Way bus facility. This has been a long standing request from the Jamaica Plain neighborhood, and it's great to finally see it uh, on there and urge you to move uh, forward on that. I uh, would ask that in increased uh, community participation take place on that. Um, the community would like to uh, point out certain uh, uh, mistakes in um, uh, the urban design uh, around the station, uh, but uh, just very happy to see such a long-standing request finally get into the CIP. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I'm going to call on to ask Mr. Alfred Diasoro uh, to speak. Mr. Diasoro, I'm asking you to unmute you now. Hello? Hello? Yes. Hello, are you there? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm sorry I joined late. I'm, I'm sorry I had another engagement, but I just want to make three quick points. I've been on the team for 71 years. I, uh, I, um, I live in East Cambridge, and I have to admit that uh, we're really cheaping out on infrastructure in the T. It's really a disgrace. Um, take a look at the old Forest Hills, Sullivan Station, Dudley Station when they were built, and I'm, I went to the New Leachmere Station the other day, four flights of stairs. I was out of breath. It was just unbelievable. I know you guys, uh, uh, it's not your fault. I know they were trying to get on the budget, but I was on the East Cambridge playing team at the time. And when the team came up, uh, when the team came up to us, they weren't even going to put a canopy on that station, which is unbelievable. But that's one thing. Number two, the blue line connector. It's an easy fix. It's just down Cambridge Street. You all already have the access from Bowden right down Cambridge Street. It would, it would take away a lot of the confusion in the central subway. It should be an easy deal to do. And third, I'm a little biased on this, but we should really start concentrating on West Station and the Grand Junction Railroad. There's a line there that's already there. You could probably start it maybe in even uh, Watertown Square. You have a bus facility there. It's being unused. I went by the other day. You have four cars parked there. You can start it there, run down uh, Parallel on the Pike, West Station, BU, Central Square, Kendall Square, East Cambridge, into Somerville. Um, it, it, it's right there in front of you. And um, I think you, you should really uh, put a lot of consideration into that. I think West Station would be really great if you could get the commuters to get off there and instead of have to go into South Station, go into Cambridge, Somerville, right from there. And you'll take away a lot of the stress out of the Central Subway. Thank you for listening to me. Um, you guys are doing a great job and um, keep up the... Uh, pressure on the politicians to keep this well-funded. Thank you for your comments. Um, we appreciate um, your comments on GLX. 
Regarding the Red Blue Connector, there is initial planning and early design work included in the CIP to support um, additional work developing that project. Um, and I, I can't say that I can comment on the Grand Junction right now. I don't know, Alistair, if... Yeah, uh, it was certainly one of, the alter one of the alternatives looked at as part of Rail Vision. Um, it wasn't immediately uh, referred by the board, but it is potentially still part of the um, um, uh, Alston project, which is separate from us. So uh, we're somewhat waiting for the timeline for that one to, to become apparent and that will sort out the future of the Grand Junction. Thank you, Alistair. Um, there were a couple of questions that were uh, in the chat um, uh, that uh, I think need some answering. The first one was uh, from Ms. Genevieve Cahill. There were three separate questions uh, pertaining to the, uh, the E line between Brigham Circle and Heath Street, uh, an area that needs some improvement. And then Cleveland Circle Street intersection, new hotels and housing, and some of the added crossing dangers and improvements on that line. And then Commonwealth at the Chestnut, um, and the, particularly the, the, the B line uh, and pedestrian dangers there. Um, and then there was some echoing here uh, that she had mentioned regarding the extension uh, that she thinks that, um, uh, that by adding that extension, it'll alleviate some of the crowding on the 39. Um, with respect to the B, with, with the B branch and answering this, Jillian, do you want, do you have any comments on that? Yeah. So the B branch accessibility and capacity improvements project that is currently in the CIP does include track realignments, accessibility improvements, potential consolidations and station and traction power upgrades along the B branch. Um, as part of that, we are continuing to work with all municipal partners to see, um, how that will impact the, the relative crossings and road reconfigurations. Um, I think that's, yes, is that, I was trying to keep track of all those, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> that was really the main question. The other ones are, I think were just more comments. Thanks, Jillian. Um, the last one here um, that I see is a question reg uh, regarding, um, Apologize, I just lost track of it. Uh, it was regarding uh, procurement. I do not. We do not know the answer to that, but um, we can see if we can um, if we can follow up with the individual regarding the particular procurement um, initiatives that were going on over in LA Metro uh, in a new approach. Um, I will say generally, the MBTA is always exploring ways to more efficiently construct their projects. The MBTA, along with MassDOT, are requesting authorization for new tools for both departments in the um, recently introduced transportation bond bill. Um, so we will look forward to seeing how those are able to um, hopefully impact the way we deliver our capital projects. All right. I believe that this answers uh, the questions that that were that were here. Um, thank you, everyone, for for joining. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and again, uh, if uh, if folks uh, would like to submit comments, uh, we urge you to use our comment tool at cipengagement at mbta.com. We'll be holding uh, one more public meeting um, that will be uh, next Tuesday, April twelfth, at seven p.m. to set to eight thirty p.m. Uh, and thanks everyone for coming and we look forward to continuing to hear your comments. Bye folks.